Hello, this is Earl Hunt from Sensibo San Filippo, and today I'm going to show you enhancements that just came out in Sage Intact 2020 Release 2 that will benefit your software as a service company. We're going to talk about features in advanced CRM integration, particularly in order entry, features in the purchasing area, features in the financial reporting area, as well as multi entity and multiple base currency functionality. In this section, I'm going to talk about the enhancement in 2020 Release 2 that pertains to the Sage Intact Advanced CRM functionality. And what has been put into this release is direct order entry integration, very similar to if you're using contracts. Uh, there's a direct integration between order entry now and Sage Intact without having to bring up any of the Sage Intact screens. We're going to take a look at that here. So I'm going to go over to Salesforce, and I'm going to we're going to look at an opportunity that we're going to sync with Intact to create a specific document. In the past, we've had buttons here at the top for creating different document types, like a sales invoice or a sales order. And when we click on one of those create document buttons, then what we get then is going to be a Sage Intact screen that is going to take the information that we have on the opportunity and populate the fields and also provide the opportunity to populate some of the other fields. But typically the people that are using Salesforce are really wanting to just take that information that's been gathered at the opportunity and go ahead and create the transaction over on the Sage Intac side and not have to deal with additional fields. So now there's the ability to put an additional field here called Sync to Intact. And I've set this opportunity so that when I sync it to Intact, it's going to create a transaction type of a sales quote. So I'll go ahead and click on the Sync to Intact button. And instead of opening up a Sage Intact window, it just simply indicates that it's synchronizing. And when it's done, it's going to come back and allow us to go back to the record. And then when we refresh that record, we'll see that immediately now we have a new sales quote that's been created uh, that's also, of course, created over on the Sage Intact side and then shadowed back over in Salesforce. What they've also done, we'll take a look at a different opportunity here, is with the, the functionality that's built into Salesforce called the Salesforce Process Builder, there's the ability then to tie a trigger to something like the change of a stage on the opportunity. In this case, we're going to change the stage from negotiation review to closed one. That's going to then run a triggered script that's going to accomplish the same process that we just saw earlier. It's going to sync to intact, but in this case, it's going to create a sales invoice transaction. So let's go ahead and bring up this change from negotiation review to closed one. And we'll go ahead and say OK on that. And when we save that, it's going to go ahead and run a script that's going to create the sales invoice over on the intact side. And we can refresh that document and come back down. And there indeed is the new sales invoice. It's already been created on the intact side, assigned it a sales invoice number and sent it back over to Salesforce to show that new invoice over on the Salesforce side underneath that opportunity. So two great enhancements on the advanced uh, CRM functionality, both the ability to sync to Intact and create whatever document type that you need, or to simply tie the creation of documents over in Sage Intact based on something like changing the stage of the opportunity. In this section, we're going to take a look at the enhancements in 2020 Release 2 as they pertain to the purchasing area. And that's primarily the use of custom email templates to create targeted communications to vendors. So this is very much like the email templates that are now available in order entry, and now they've been extended to the purchasing area as well. 
Go take a look at where that information resides. Go over to Company and over to Email Templates, and we're going to take a look at an example of a purchase order email template that I created. And it's very simple to create these templates, and you can have as many templates as you want. You can have a default template, and you can also assign templates specifically to vendors. We'll take a look at an example of that as well. So here we're naming the template. This is a purchase order template. We're coming down here and specifying the reply to address and name. And then we come down here and we have a variety of different types of fields that we can use for the contact lookup. And it's simply dropping down and looking at either contact email one or two and so forth, a ship to contact, a bill to contact. And when you choose one of those, it's going to then fill in that particular merge field that then you can use in, in this case, the contact uh, lookup and the, the two, the CC and the BCC fields. As we get down into the message content itself down below, then we've got both document element lookup fields as well as company element lookup fields. And we'll see here that I put in dear and use that contact first name, contact last name. Uh, and then in the body of this email template, it, it says attach will find our purchase order number. And I simply searched for the document ID here and it came up with that merge field. And then I simply copy and then paste that in. So now that the, the purchase order uh, number will show in the body of the email. Same thing on the date, that's another drop down field. And then the total amount of the PO is also a document field that you just simply look up and then copy from the section and paste it into the body of your email template. Once that's done, you go ahead and save your template. And then we can then go over and either make that the default template, which is a default for any vendors that we don't specifically set up to use that, or we can go over to a vendor specifically. Let's take a look at amazon.com and go over and look at the additional information. And we see down below that we have now email template options, and we can have a a specific email template for each transaction type, whether it be a requisition, a purchase order, and so forth, that ties that transaction definition to the email template. And then when we go down here and enter, enter a purchase order, we go over here to purchase orders and take a look at a purchase order that's been entered specifically for Amazon. And you'll also note that we have an attachment and there's a field that you can select on the email template itself that specifies whether or not you want to send the vendor any of the attachments that are attached to, in this case, the purchase order document. And then the next process would be very similar to uh, what you've done in the past is going in printing or emailing the transactions. And so that might be done on a daily basis and you go through and choose the start end date and so forth. In this case, I'm gonna click previously sent because I don't have any new ones and I'll go ahead and view that. And now we see purchase orders, including the purchase order number five that we just looked at, that we can go ahead and email out to the vendor right from the screen. And because this one has an attachment, they're also going to receive the attachment as well, along with the PDF copy of the purchase order. And this is what they would receive. And so here's the merge where it's picking up the first and last name, attached you will find purchase order number five, dated 623 in the amount of 333.33 and what other, whatever other verbiage that you need to go along in the body of the email. You see that the PDF copy of the purchase order is attached as well as the attachment that was part of that original purchase order document, in this case, a statement of work. In this section, we're gonna talk about the new functionality in 2020 release two that enables better access to reports in the Reports Center. This is actually an enhancement that was recommended by the user community. 
I'm going to go over here to the reports section and we're going to take a look at the setup on the reports and now there's two additional fields that can be populated on each financial report. The first one is the type of report and these are all user definable. So I've uh, created some report types that are financial, management reports, subledger, and trend analysis type reports. And then the second field that is new that you can put onto each of your financial reports is report audiences. And I've created ones for banks, for board of directors, and for, for internal accounting. And then when we go take a look at the list of our financial reports, we see now that we can put these additional fields of both report type and report audience on each of the reports. I'll take a look here, maybe bring up this balance sheet detail, and here you see these new drop-down fields of report type. This is clearly a financial report, and the report audience for the balance sheet detail is going to be internal accounting. And then we go ahead and save that report again with those new fields. We can also um, do ad hoc searches. So I might want to take a look at uh, perhaps all of my subledger detail reports by putting in SUB and hitting enter. And then that's going to narrow it down to just the subledger detail reports. We can also, just like we can on any list of information in Sage Intact, is we can create a special views of this information. And here I've created one that's just going to filter out for the board of director reports. And of course, I can reposition and add different fields to that listing. And now we're seeing all of the reports where the audience is board of directors, along with the report type, and then the individual reports themselves, and still the ability to go ahead and run the report from this screen to schedule reports and export out to a variety of different formats, including HTML, CSV, PDF, and Excel. In this section, we're going to take a look at the 2020 R2 enhancements that pertain to multi-entity and even multi-base currency companies. We're going to first take a look at the inter-entity account setup, followed by inter-entity journal entries across different base currencies, and then finally, we're going to take a look at the one inter-entity journal entry that's now created in accounts payable and accounts receivable transactions instead of multiple postings to multiple journal entries. So when we take a look at inter-entity account setup, if you recall, uh, before this enhancement, you had a tab that was on each entity for inter-entity setup and you needed to touch each of your entities to set that up. Now everything has been consolidated over on company in inter-entity account mapping. And so this is one location where you can manage all of the inter-entity accounts for each of your relationships between entities. For example, at the bottom here, we see a UK company as entity A and an Irish company as entity B. And then we're able to put all four of those inter-entity do to and do froms in this one screen without having to touch each of the entities. So vastly improved over what was happening before. As we move on to inter-entity journal entries across different base currencies, I'm going to go over here to my general ledger, and we're going to go to journal entries and pull up general journal. And I've got an entry that I started that's in draft mode, and this entry is taking some salaries and allocating the salaries from the U.S. holding company for 10,000 U.S. dollars across both the Canadian company and the UK company. So previous to this enhancement, if this was done, you would have to balance this entry yourself and put in the corresponding do to do froms. Here, I'm gonna go ahead and post this entry and then we're gonna come back and take a look at it again. And now you see that the system has 
has circled back and it has created automatically the corresponding due to, in this case, the U.S. holding company from both the Canadian company and the U.K. company, and due, due from Canada to the U.S. holding company and due from U.K., also to the U.S. holding company. So vastly improved technology here and enhanced capabilities so that you can automatically have postings done and truly put in inter-company multiple base currency transactions. And this leads us into our final enhancement in this area, which is one inter-entity journal entry that now gets created. You see that here when we're looking at a general ledger transaction, but if we had, for example, over on accounts payable and take a look at an accounts payable bill, I'm going to pull up this bill here from American Express. And this bill is in, is posted to a U.S. company, uh, but the currency is in Canadian dollars. And when we circle back and look at how that was actually paid, we see that the payment I'll drill down to the payment here. We see that the payment was done by the Royal Bank of Canada, which belongs to the Canadian company. And so obviously that's going to trigger for us some inter-entity due from, due to, due from transactions. In the past, before this enhancement, it would create entries in not only the cash disbursements journal, but it would also create two other entries, one in the inter-entity accounts payable journal and the other in the inter-entity accounts receivable journal. Now everything that pertains to that inter-entity cash disbursement transaction is now contained in the cash disbursement transaction journal. So I'll pull that up and we see we've got the accounts payable here, the debit to accounts payable. Uh, we've got the, the credit here to the cash account over on the Canadian company. And we've got uh, some timing differences here in the different currency rates. So we've got an actual currency uh, gain here and that corresponding uh, transaction over to the accounts payable. And then down below, because now we can have multiple base currency journal entries, we see the corresponding inter-entity transactions that make this journal entry all work together and balance that has the due to Canada for the U.S. holding company and due from the U.S. holding company in the Canadian company. Also, we can then easily create reports that will show us inter-entity transactions. Here's a report that I created in the custom report writer and we can just run that here for the current month and we can see all of our inter-entity transactions and then we can drill down on the transaction here that we looked at before which is this payment uh, from the Canadian bank on behalf of the US company and that gets us down to the one now consolidated journal entry that has not only the accounts payable and the credit to cash transaction but also the corresponding due to due froms. If you're interested in learning more and wa or want a detailed demonstration of any of these features or have questions don't hesitate to reach out to our team here at Sensiba San Filippo. Thank you.